Uh, thanks, Jan, for the introduction. So first, before I start, I would like to uh, give a very uh, special thanks to the students and postdocs who have helped me uh, preparing those slides, in particular Rodolphe Genaton, Julien Meral, and uh, Guillaume uh, Obozinski. Uh, also, so what I will try to do today is to give you an overview of, the, uh, of this uh, hot topic of sparse methods for machine learning. And I will try as much as I can to, work, to talk about the work of others. But as Jan has uh, uh, said, sometimes it's hard to do so. And you always try to uh, snip in some of your own work, which I will do and with limited amounts. And also, I've been doing a lot of reading in the last uh, two or three weeks. But I may have uh, forgotten someone. So if you don't see yourself, yourself on the slides, don't get mad at me. And uh, it does not mean that you don't do good work on sparse methods. So let me uh, start by giving an overview uh, before I go uh, more into the details. So this is a very uh, usual setting in machine learning, at least for supervised learning. You have uh, input data X belonging to uh, some uh, input space capital X. So I'm not used uh, to manipulating these little hands. So I will try to uh, point towards the screen with the, with the hand. So this is a capital X, it will be any kind of input space, and you want to predict a function Y, uh, a value Y, and half of machine learning is considering this uh, empirical risk minimization framework when you minimize an objective function, which will uh, try to, um, uh, so you want to optimize with respect to a function from X to Y, give me an X, you want to predict a Y, and you have a uh, data fitting term, error on data points, which is the sum of uh, all your data points of a loss between your true value yi and your prediction f of xi, and a regularization term, uh, which is usually a norm or a square norm. So there are a lot of issues associated with this uh, framework. And uh, the main two issues are which loss should you choose for which type of y. And this, I won't consider this too much in this tutorial. I will mainly assume that this is solved, either uh, if you use a least square regression, if yi is a real number, or if you use a support vector machine or logistic, if you use a YI being a, a discrete, uh, discrete valued uh, number. So I will mainly focus on, this, on the choice of the function space and on the norm. And I will consider various types of norm. And here you have two, uh, the goal of adding a norm, of course, is to avoid overfitting. And now you have two main lines of works in this, uh, in this setting. You have two camps. The first camp is the one of Euclidean norms or Hilbertian norms. And this uh, is uh, essentially the camp of kernel methods. And the good thing is that it allows you to do a, a non-linear predictor. And also the theory, at least uh, as far as I'm concerned, is well developed. And you have a lot of algorithms which are available for those type of, uh, of uh, regularizer. So the second camp is the, the camp of sparsity uh, inducing norms. So here, usually, as a, as a start, is restricted to linear predictors. So you want to predict from x as a linear function of uh, x. And of course, the main example is the L1 norm, which is just the sum of the absolute values. So here, the cool thing is that it does two things at the same time. It will both uh, avoid overfitting and also create some zeros into your uh, estimator, estimator for w. So it does both model selection and uh, regularization. And here, this is the main topic of the tutorial. The theory, the theoretical part, and the algorithmic work is really in progress, and this is the topic of this tutorial. So the first aspect I will cover is the aspect of uh, algorithms. So which one, uh, which one is faster? Is it L2 or L1? So here, this is a picture uh, taken from a statistics journal and kindly given to me by Stéphane Canu. This is a Gaussian hair against the Laplacian tortoise. So Gauss was in favor of L2 and uh, Laplace was in favor of, um, of L1. And since L1 is not differentiable, we will see that it might look as it is harder to optimize. So this is the Laplace and tortoise. And since L2 usually leads to a nice, smooth, convex optimization problems, uh, where if you have a square loss, you get uh, just a linear system. It's supposed to be easier. And this is a Gaussian hair. And of course, we, which which one uh, wins? This is a tortoise, OK? And uh, we, we will see. So first, it's nice for two things, because Laplace is French. And even better, Laplace uh, was a professor at École Normale Supérieure. So you see that uh, it's really an important topic at, at my school. And this will be achieved by, uh, essentially, first-order methods. We will 
which we will see at the same complexity for L1 and L2. And also, I think, uh, also an homotopy method, which can use the fact that you are going to get a sparse solution. And we will uh, get that into the details. We will get into the details of that. Then we go a bit over the theoretical results associated with, uh, with those type of regularizer. And I will mainly focus on two types of results. The first result will be on uh, support recovery. And in a sense, in this setting, I think theory was kind of late with respect to, uh, to applications. So people have been using L1 norms for, for a while and would always promise that it does two things. It, it will prevent overfitting and select good zeros. And it has been only recently that people have really analyzed how, which zeros are we actually getting and do we get the correct zeros. And what I will uh, show you is that you get uh, necessary and sufficient condition for uh, exact support recovery. And uh, it involves the uh, covariance matrix of your covariates, uh, Q. And essentially, if you remove uh, th these parts, it says that to get uh, the correct support, you need Q uh, to have a low correlation between variables. And we see that it is both a positive result. It will tell you when I and mean, you don't get the good support but also to me a very negative one in the sense that since your data are often correlated, this shows that we never get the good support. Then we will get to the second uh, aspect, which is the high dimensional inference, where uh, people uh, try to derive uh, results which say that you can still predict well if the number of uh, features, P, is uh, at most exponential in the number of observations. So throughout this uh, tutorial, P will be the number of features, and n will be the number of uh, observations. Then I will go over uh, trying to go beyond the lasso because I personally think that applying the lasso directly is almost uh, never useful. You know, saying that you will, uh, you only have a few linear problems in, uh, in machine learning, and you really want to be able to go beyond that. And I will consider first non-linearities through uh, adding kernels. Then trying to see uh, if you can actually deal with uh, exponentially many features. Can you really run an algorithm where log p equals n? And then I will consider uh, the topic of sparse learning on matrices. So in terms of uh, uh, features, so theory is promising that we could uh, get good results in terms of predictive performance if log p is at most equal to n. But what happens when n equals 1,000? Theory says in the sense that you could deal with uh, exponential 1,000 features. So it's kind of a, a lot if you want to, uh, to run an algorithm with that. And I will see how you can use structure within the features to design algorithms which can be run in polynomial time uh, in N, even though you, you are implicitly considering exponentially many features. And this will be uh, involving um, uh, uh, norms which are grouped with groups of variables which may overlap. Then I will consider so sparse methods and matrices, and this includes a lot of application of machine learning, multitask, multi-class, uh, matrix completion, image noising, uh, topic models, NMF. And I will mostly consider two types of sparsity, uh, low rank and uh, uh, what people often call sparse PCA or dictionary learning. So this will be the outline of, uh, of the tutorial. The first part on the, on the lasso with uh, algorithms and uh, theoretical results and uh, one part of, on steel on vectors where we, are, we consider structured sparse methods, and finally, sparse methods on matrices. So before uh, I start to go into the details, I think you've all seen that slice. It's going to be pretty, pretty quick. So why L1 norm uh, leads to sparse uh, solutions? And uh, one simple way to, uh, to see that is to consider the constrained problem. So first, first throughout this talk, I will either penalized by the L1 norm or constrained by the L1 norm. And this is equivalent in the sense that for any uh, T uh, where you constrain, there is a lambda for which you can penalize by lambda times norm of W. Okay, so I will go back and forth between those two. And of course, the mapping from lambda and T is not, uh, depends on data. Okay, that's why I say equivalent between, uh, between quotes. So why does L1 norm lead to sparsity is here I've plotted uh, the level sets of a quadratic function. Okay, so the goal is to minimize. So if you do unconstrained minimization, you will uh, end up at the center of the, of the ellipses. And of course, we'll be constrained to the uh, to L1 ball. And an L1 ball is simply a square like that. So you see that depending on where uh, the quadratic function is located, you will get 
Uh, no zeros over there, you will get, so you, the optimum is obtained when the, the red curve touches the, the uh, blue uh, square. Here you get no sparsity, but since you have corners in the airborne ball, it will be attracted to the corners, and these are exactly the points which are equal to zero. Okay, so this is a simple uh, geometric intuition why L1 norms lead to sparsity. Okay, so this is a point that we will consider uh, for the next uh, half hour or so. So here you assume a, a linear, mo linear model where we have xi are often referred to as covariates and yi as responses. So here I will uh, leave a, a script uh, capital Y unspecified, so it can be either the real numbers or discrete values. And so the, we will consider this uh, regularized, regularized problem where you have a sum of an error on data plus a regularizer. So here I will not include a constant term B because it just makes uh, life harder. This can be easily added. And uh, again, it can be either using a penalized formulation like that or a constrained formulation. So when you have a square loss, this has been used a lot in mainly two communities. In signal processing, this is called, called basis pursuit. And in statistics and machine learning, it is called the, the lasso. So I will start first by doing a small review of non-smooth convex analysis and convex optimization. In a sense, the L1 norm is non-differentiable, and this creates some technicalities, and I will spend 15 minutes trying to deal with those in the simplest possible way. So we go over analysis, which will how can we say that we are uh, optimal and how uh, we can optimize uh, later. So there is a, a nice sequence of books related to those topics from Boyd, and uh, to uh, which is uh, focused a lot on interior points, to uh, Bonance et al, and also Boren and Lewis, which is a bit more related to analysis. So those are all good books uh, to get more into this topic. So let's start with the simple things first. When you have a, an L2 regularizer, so you have the same, the same term, uh, error on data, plus now the square, the square of the L2 norm. So this is the square of the L2 norm. So now this is a differentiable problem if L is differentiable with respect to the second uh, variable. You can compute the gradient. So this is simply the gradient that's for the loss plus the gradient for the, uh, for the regularizer. And of course, to be optimal, you just set the gradient equal to zero. In the case of the square loss, so we can uh, reparameterize a bit uh, this uh, loss function, where y is just a vector with all uh, values of yi, so it's a vector of size n, and capital X is a design matrix, which is n times p, where all of the n observations are stacked uh, row by row. So this loss function, this uh, uh, sum of the losses of all data points, where the, the loss is, uh, the squ is square, is simply uh, can be done with this simple formula. So if you take the derivative of that one, the gradient, you get this value, and if you invert, you get the usual normal equations. So this is uh, when life is easy, and when you have a square loss and a square regularizer. So if you remember one thing about that tutorial, this is uh, this one, okay? The L1 norm is none, is not differentiable. So if you try to copy this gradient, it's bound to fail at one point, okay? So the good tools to do that, uh, you have two sets of tools, uh, the one of them is to consider directional derivatives, which I will uh, look at in this tutorial, or you may use subgradient. So you can go back and forth between those two, but it's simpler to, uh, to present directional derivatives, which I will do uh, in the, this line. So never try to compute the gradient of the L1 norm. You can always cook out some stuff when W is far from zero, but at zero, it's kind of a problematic. So what you need to do is to consider, in fact, derivatives along all possible directions, okay? So you look at the direction delta in RP, and you take the tau from W and go along this uh, direction and see uh, the rate of change along that direction, which is exactly, uh, exactly that, uh, this thing. And this is exactly what people call the directional derivative in the direction of, um, of delta. So the cool thing when uh, J is convex and continuous is that it always, uh, always exists. And why do we need to consider that? Essentially, in, uh, in the non-smooth optimization, you need to be able to consider all possible directions and not only p uh, different ones. So the gradient is essentially uh, looking at p different directions. With non-smooth optimization, you need to look at all possible ones. And in 1D, it means looking at two, okay, left and right. Of course, 
when J is differentiable, then you have a strong link between uh, directional derivatives and gradients, namely that the directional derivative is the linear function of your uh, direction, okay? So now how do, how do you decide whether you're optimal or not? So this, is, this is simple. See, this is just the rate of change in direction delta. If you're optimal, this rate of change should be going up. So for unconstrained minimization, uh, you're optimal if only if for all directions you go up, meaning that uh, you locally go up, meaning that uh, the directional derivative is positive for every direction. Okay? First, if the function is uh, smooth, it does reduce to the, uh, to the zero gradient condition because having a linear function being positive must be zero. Okay? So this is just a safety check. We get back zero gradient. And for constraint minimization, I won't go over it. It's just for, uh, for reference. So now how does it look like for, uh, for the L1 norm? So this is one of the few uh, slides with, uh, with uh, details and proofs. But I think this, this one is quite important. So if you get that point, you get most of it. Uh, it's not totally true, but uh, a bit true. Okay. So this is a loss uh, plus the lambda times the regularizer. So I will call L, capital L of W the loss, which is the sum of all data points. And you need to, so this one I will assume differentiable. Okay. So when you need to compute the derivative, the first term, is simply the gradients times delta. Now for the norm, if you compute the rate of change or the change along direction delta, you immediately, immediately see that you have to make a distinction between uh, J index, indices for which the value J is, is zero and indices for which it is non-zero. So when it is zero, essentially far away from zero, your function is linear, okay? So it behaves like, like a linear function. But at zero, when uh, WJ is zero, then if uh, you always uh, get uh, this a positive term, so when you divide by epsilon and take the limit, you will get a non-linear term of the directional derivative, and uh, which is happening uh, here. Okay. So now, if you uh, mix uh, the L1 norm with uh, the differentiable part, you get a sum. So you get a separable sum, a sum of all possible uh, j. So j goes from 1 to p. And you have the differentiable part on the left for which uh, j, wj is non-zero. And you have the non-differential part when uh, wj uh, is zero. Okay? So now, how do we get optimality conditions? w will be optimal if this is positive for all possible delta. So since, you have, uh, since this is separable in uh, delta j for all j, you, have to, you need all those terms to be, um, to be positive. So for this one, it means that this is zero because this is a linear function, which is positive only if it is always equal to zero. And you get uh, this one. Uh, this has to be positive. And this essentially uh, requires that this term is uh, less than lambda in absolute value. Why? Because if it is uh, less than lambda, then this is uh, this is always positive because it is always bigger than minus the value. If minus the value is bigger than, uh, than uh, minus lambda, you get a positive value. Okay. So this is uh, so if you think about it a few a few more seconds, you will see that you need the absolute value of the gradient to be less than lambda, and this is what you get. Then you get uh, at your optimal if your the gradient of the loss plus lambda times the sine of wj is zero for non-zero wj, and the gradient is smaller than lambda when, uh, when wj is zero. Okay? So this is uh, optimality conditions. And uh, for the square loss, these those can be specialized because the gradient can be expressed uh, easily. So throughout this uh, tutorial, x sub j will essentially be the design matrix uh, corresponding to variables which are indexed by j. Okay? So x sub uh, J is just the data for the J variable. So this is just a gradient of the loss, like we saw in the uh, previous slide for the square for the square loss. Okay. So this is those are the optimality conditions. So now this will tell you if you're optimal or not. And now you have to see how do we get to those uh, to those conditions because those cannot be inverted. With zero gradient and with a square loss, the cool thing is that if you write down the optimality conditions, you can invert the system and get a solution. Here, this is not the case. And usually, iterative algorithms uh, are needed. So I will here focus first on smooth optimization, just to give a review 
of existing results uh, in that setting. So we mainly focus on the gradient descent, where you, where you, you go from WT to WT uh, plus one by just uh, going on the negative, uh, following uh, the opposite direction of the gradient with a small parameter alpha sub t. So here you have a lot of strategies to do, um, to, uh, to choose alpha sub t. And the one which I like, but there are other ones, is to do a, a line search. So not an exact line search, because it is kind of useless to spend so, many, so much time optimizing the wrong function, but a, a line search with a stopping rules like the army Joe one. And also you can consider fixed diminishing step size, where, which we decay in, uh, as one over t, okay, plus some constant. So th those, uh, with those two line searches, there is a strong uh, body of literature trying to see how fast they do converge, uh, how fast they converge to the uh, global minimum of the function. So here, I assume that f is convex. So if there, there, is no, there are no local minima. And if you look at the, on the nice book by Nesterov, uh, then you can uh, really uh, find convergence rates for all of uh, for these methods. So what the take home message is that the nicer your function looks, uh, the faster the convergence rate is for the same method, okay? So if f is convex and just slip cheats, so this is just uh, the simplest assumption you can make on the, on, the, on the function, then you converge to the, to, uh, to the best value at rate one over square root of t, which is rather, uh, rather slow. If now you assume that you are differentiable, so what people call but, uh, smooth with l lip cheats L Lipschitz gradients. So for those who are not familiar to the Lipschitz gradients, it, is, it essentially means that uh, if your function was twice differentiable, it means that the second derivative is uh, uh, uniformly bounded uh, from, uh, from above by L. So if you assume that your function is differentiable, you, you know that you go faster. And if you assume, uh, moreover, that the function is strongly convex, so essentially it means that if your function uh, was uh, twice differentiable, the second derivatives are bounded from below this time, then you get an exponential rate of convergence. So it goes, uh, it goes a lot faster than uh, at the inverse of t. It goes as an uh, as, uh, as exponential function uh, of t. So this number, mu over L, is exactly what people call the condition number of the opti optimization problem. Essentially, if this is small, and for example, equal to zero, uh, gradient descent will converge very slowly because you get back to this L over T world or M over square root of T world. But if you find mu over L is large, then you get exponential convergence. So this is to me very important because it will tell you when uh, simple methods are expected to work uh, or not. And this depends on the condition number. And uh, again, if your function is twice differentiable, this is just the ratio of the minimal eigenvalue of the Hessian over the maximal eigenvalue of the, uh, of the Hessian. Then for coordinate descent, this is, uh, uh, you have similar types of property. And just to mention that uh, gradient descent is by no means the best possible methods, uh, best possible first order method for optimization. And you have also in the nice book by Nesterov, you have a, a lot of other schemes which will attain a lot better bounds, often called as uh, sometimes Nesterov, uh, Nesterov uh, methods, which will achieve uh, rates which are uh, quicker because t minus two goes quicker and square root of, um, of u over l is uh, larger than u over l. Okay. <clears throat> so just keep in mind that gradient descent is not the end of the story. So now, for not, this was for smooth optimization. So now for non-smooth optimization, then you have no gradients. So you have uh, the first simple method is to follow the subgradient. So I didn't, I didn't want to define subgradients, but in a sense, uh, I have to here. So the subgradient is simply uh, g of t, the subgradient, if it is uh, below the if it is, if it is locally uh, below the function. So if the directional derivatives are greater than the corresponding linear function. So in a sense, it is a gradient where the function is differentiable, and it is something which is a, a tangent, which defines a tangent when the function is non-differentiable. So here, you have to be very careful. If you replace just gradient descent by subgradient descent, you might not converge, even if you, if you do the exact line search. 
So this is somewhat counterintuitive, and there is a counterexample on the slides I, I, won't go, I won't go over, but this is uh, very important. Simple methods in the context of non-smooth optimization might not work. Exact, with exact line search, it doesn't work, but for diminishing step size, it does convert to the global minimum. So it's kind of counterintuitive, and I have no explanation why, but uh, sometimes it works like this, sometimes it doesn't. Also, coordinate descent, which is also a very simple method, is not always uh, convergent to the global optimum. So let's give for this, for this uh, simple counterexample. So this is a function of two variables. Those are the level sets, value one, two, three, four, five, uh, one, two, three, four, five. So the function goes up uh, in that direction. So if you want to go down, if you, if you start from zero, uh, if you look at, at, along the, the two axes, along W1, you go up, so you're, you think you should stop. If you long, look at, along W2, you go up, so you think you should stop. So any uh, coordinate descent algorithm would stop at that point, but there is a direction, uh, direction of uh, descent, which is this one. So this is a very simple example that will tell everything. You have to be able to look at all directions. Since coordinate descent does not, it might not be convergent to the global minimum. And also, I have funny stories with Gert Langtry trying to optimize such a function at 4 a.m. before the NIPS deadline. And I can tell you, it does not converge. <laughs> okay. And, uh, okay, so, and in terms of uh, convergence rate, if you do regular subgradient, it's the same as gradient descent uh, with no assumptions. Okay, so this, uh, keep in mind that coordinate descent is not always convergent. What I will say in two slides is that for the lasso, it is convergent, okay? So it's not always convergent, but it is in some, in some settings, and for the lasso, it is. So before I go on, uh, this is a, I won't go over it. So uh, last point, I think quite important uh, for sparse methods is that, so true, uh, the objective function for a sparse problem is non-differentiable, but it's not any non-differentiable function. So if you assume the loss is differentiable, uh, you get uh, an objective function which is of the form L of W, which is differentiable, plus lambda times the norm, which might not be differentiable. Or if you use a constrained version, you get a minimizer, you want to minimize a convex differentiable function with a constraint. And if you assume that L is smooth, and if on top of it you assume that you know how to project on the ball, on the ball defined by the norm, or the ball defined by the dual norm. So if, so if you don't know what the dual norm is, uh, simply the dual norm of the L1 norm is the L infinity norm, okay? And uh, it, it should be enough at the moment. So if you know how to project on the ball defined by the norm, and this you can do for the L1 ball, this you can do for the L infinity ball, then you may use uh, similar techniques than smooth optimization, which I won't go into in this, in this tutorial for because I don't have uh, time to talk only about algorithms. And simple ones are projected gradient descent, and also uh, proximal methods, uh, which I won't talk uh, a lot. So just for reference, uh, if you want to look at that. And the good thing is that with those types of methods, you get the similar uh, convergence rates than for smooth optimization. Namely, it will depend a lot on the condition number of the loss function, okay? So if the loss function is well conditioned, it will uh, converge quickly at exponential rate. And if it's not, it will, converse, it will converge slowly at a rate of uh, 1 over t. Okay, so this is very important in terms of optimization. So now let's look at the lasso and consider uh, simple algorithms for, for that. So the first one is coordinate descent. So I told you, I told you that you should not use it, but in fact you can uh, in this setting. And the main reason is that uh, the uh, optimality conditions are uh, separable. So if you go back here, uh, in this setting, you look that uh, if you optimize only along one variable, you want that uh, to be true. And you see that for all j, uh, the condition for the variable j is independent from the condition from the other variables. And this is one of the reasons why uh, coordinate descent uh, is convergent, uh, is convergent with, um, uh, with uh, the A1 norm. Okay, so we have another Simple proof later, but this is, uh, so the good thing is that uh, if you optimize with respect to one variable, this is exactly iterative uh, thresholding, because you optimize, yep. You mean linear case, square loss? Uh, 
Uh, in fact, so the, uh, linear, what do you mean, if you have, uh, I don't see your question. Linear prediction rule. Sure, but so, okay, but uh, if you have a non-linear prediction rule, you're not convex anymore, and uh, then I don't exactly if know. If it is non-separable, it, it will not converge. It might in some, in some settings, and in fact, the same story is GERT. It did on some simple UCA data sets, but if you take another data set, it doesn't converge. So it, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And you, you don't want a method which might not be convergent. This is uh, very important because it you might get stuck and you don't notice it, which is a, a problem. So, uh, so uh, before I go on, so the good, good thing about coordinate descent is that it, this is very simple to implement because you can optimize with one, if you have one variable, you have to optimize a quadratic function of one variable plus an uh, absolute value, and this can be done in closed form, and this is just iterative thresholding, and I'll show an example in a, in, in a, in a few slides. So this is very simple uh, methods, but here you have to keep in mind that this is a first order method, so if you act, if your covariance matrix is uh, has low correlations, it, be, it will be quite fast. But if you have high correlations between your, between your variables, it means that you have a low condition number, and it means that it might get very slow. Okay. A second type of technique, so I call that the eta trick, because this is how we refer to it uh, in my group. And it is simply uh, a method that will uh, do iterat iterative least squares. So you, if you take the L1 norm like that, and you can, get, you can see it as a minimum over any of the, of the vector eta. So eta is a vector in RP, which is positive. So here, if you optimize with respect to eta here, the optimal eta is exactly w, is the square root of Wj. Uh, no, the absolute value of Wj, and you get back uh, the absolute value of Wj. So now, if you want to optimize uh, with this term, you can iteratively optimize uh, that term instead by updating eta uh, at each iteration. So essentially, you spend one, one time minimizing with respect to eta, and then you minimize with respect to W with eta fix, and those two problems are simple. Uh, eta by eta, uh, with respect to eta, it is in closed form, and with respect to W, since we have turned the L1 norm into the L2 norm, it's supposed to be easier. But all those do not use the fact that you're sparse, and uh, I think this is uh, nice, but I do prefer a uh, method that uses uh, sparsity, and we will now uh, see how we can, uh, we can do that. So for that, I will uh, restrict to the square laws because it, allows, it is a lot simpler to, uh, to present. So first, something, that we, something which you should never do is to write that as a quadratic program. Okay, so the L1 norm can be written. Uh, you, can ex you can separate the positive part as the negative part, and you get a nice, quad a nice QP, okay, quadratic term with linear, uh, li linear uh, constraint. So this is all nice, but this is, if you use any generic toolbox, this will be uh, very, very slow. So never, uh, never do that. But for the square loss, you have other stuff that you might use, and the main one and it is that if you know in advance the sign pattern of the solution, so if you know which variable should be positive, which one should be negative, and which one should be zero, then, then you know the solution in closed form. Why? Because if you know which one uh, should be zero, uh, non-zero, so J will be uh, those ones, then you can rewrite the objective, uh, this is uh, the loss, we, we just restrict to variables in J, and you replace the L1 norm by just uh, a linear function which depends on the, on the sign. Okay, if you know the sign, you can do that. And of course, this is a quadratic function which you can uh, optimize in closed form, and you get exactly this uh, simple uh, equation. So if you give me the sign in advance, the sign vector in advance, then you can uh, simply uh, get the solution. So of course, you have a lot of sign vectors. You have three to the p uh, different sign vectors. So this is not, uh, you still need to guess in some sense the sign vector. And once you have the sign vector, you need to check whether you're optimal or not. So how do you check whether you're optimal or not? Uh, so this is just uh, your candidate vector, candidate sign vector, the non-zero pattern, which I sometimes call the support of your solution. And if uh, you have that sign vector, you know in advance it's going to be of that form. So now you have to check the two optimality conditions that I've described in, uh, earlier in the tutorial. 
The first one that the sign of WJ is actually, actually uh, S sub J. Okay, this is the one uh, condition. And also that the, uh, the gradient with respect to the inactive variables are less than lambda. Okay, so this is the two conditions you need, uh, you need to check. And now you have two strategies for that. Either you construct uh, the set J iteratively, so you start from zero and keep adding uh, variables until uh, you can uh, have that satisfied. And the good thing is that uh, it only requires a small number of linear systems. So to get WJ, okay, you need to invert uh, to solve a least, least square problem reduced to a cardinal J uh, variable, which is uh, uh, efficient. Okay. But the techniques, uh, the, te the technique I really like is uh, homotopy methods for the square loss. So this has been reinvented multiple times. And in fact, uh, the first one to do it was Markovitz in 1956 then Osborne, and then the Lars in 2004. And the idea is very simple. If that is to notice that if, uh, is to get first, the, goal is some, are somewhat, the goals are somewhat ambitious. Um, you want to get not one solution for one lambda, but all solutions for all possible lambda. And for that, you just notice that if you know the sun vector, so S, this is a solution of, uh, of your problem. It is uh, affine in lambda, great. And it is valid as long as those two conditions are satisfied. And the sign condition is also uh, it's a, it's a linear constraint. The subgradient condition or the directional derivative condition is also uh, something which is linear in lambda. So at the end, uh, you get an interval of lambda. Uh, for, uh, for each sign vector, you get an interval of lambda, which may be uh, empty, for which the solution is optimal uh, for, that, uh, for that lambda. So at the end, it means that you, are, you have a set of possible uh, affine function for your problem for each interval of lambda. So your solution WJ at the function of lambda is piecewise affine. So here I slip under the rug the possibility of having non-unique solutions. So you can uh, deal with that, but I won't, uh, I won't here. So now what you need is simply, and simply should be put, should be put in quotes, find, uh, find breakpoints in that piecewise affine function. And this is exactly what Markowitz and others have been doing for the last uh, 53 years. OK, uh, so how, how does it, uh, I won't go into the details because it's kind of uh, boring. Just to show you uh, how it looks like when you, uh, when you, uh, when you uh, run the algorithm. So in, in abscess, you get uh, lambda, OK, and uh, you get the weights over here. So I'm just showing this picture for the yellow. Can you see it? Yes. I'm just showing this for the yellow uh, for the yellow weight. Okay, so when you start with the large lambda, so everything is equal to zero. You select nobody, you regularize a lot, and as soon as you reduce lambda, you start to add some variables. Okay, so these ones, and you see that you might uh, some variables might disappear from the active set. Okay, so this is uh, somewhat counterintuitive. You might decide at one point that uh, you should add the yellow variable, and then uh, decide that uh, you should remove it. Okay. So it's quite rare that variables come in and out, but it does happen. So this is why there is no, uh, currently no uh, complexity bound for this uh, method, because you can design examples for which it, all variables will come in and out many, many times. Okay? But in practice, it took me uh, 10 minutes to find such an example by using random matrices, so it's not, it's not so common. So this is now going back to this Gaussian hair and Laplace and tortoise. This is with this uh, homotopy method that you really see the difference. All those uh, first order methods, which are direct methods, like coordinate descent, somewhat if uh, you don't, you, they don't use sparsity uh, directly, so you might, but it creates some uh, technicalities. But if you just apply them straight, you get the same cost per iteration, which is O of times P of N. P is the number of features, and N is the number of variables. But if you use exact, so exact means uh, solutions which rely on uh, inverting a system, so which will have a, a precision of uh, your machine precision, usually. And you see that there's a strong gain uh, from P square N for the L2 norm to KPN for the uh, L1 norm. So this is just one of the reasons why the uh, L1 norm does win. It, it uses the fact that if you stop at only k active variables, then you get a faster solution. Of course, if you need to select all of the variables, you get back to p squared of n, and there's no magic, because at the end, when lambda equals zero, 
you get back the uh, ordinarily square, so it must be p square of n when k equals p. But in many cases, since you hope for sparsity, you hope for sparsity so you hope for k small, this is somewhat uh, efficient. So there are a lot of additional methods which I won't, uh, I won't go, uh, go into, namely proximal methods. So optimal methods in the sense for the, uh, as Nestor of methods have been applied to this problem. And let's make some advertisement for, uh, for software from the group. So the SPAM software is essentially implementing all of these uh, in C++ and MATLAB, and it's uh, rather efficient, as I, you will see in the later part of the tutorial, where we are able to use uh, that for image denoising. So now I've, I went over the convex optimization and, and uh, algorithms, so I'm already quite late. Okay, so now let's go over the theoretical results. So here you have, uh, we will uh, consider the square loss because life is easier with the square loss. So the main assumption that we will make is that the data are generated from a certain sparse W, so W ball, and it's supposed to be sparse to have a lot of zeros, and K will, ref K will uh, denote K, the num uh, number of non-zero values for that, for that setting. So now you have three main problems that people have been considering. Uh, first, the problem of regular consistency. You want W hat, so W hat will be your estimator uh, obtained from the lasso. Uh, how, uh, how quick W hat converts to W bold is regular consistency. You have model selection consistency. Do you get the correct zeros uh, when the number of data points increase, uh, increases? And also, something which is uh, more classical in machine learning, you want your uh, estimator to uh, lead to good predictions. You don't care if you estimate the good zeros. You don't care if you're close to W ball. What you want is uh, predictions which are, uh, which are as good as the ones obtained by W ball. So I will uh, show two main results. The first, one, the first one is condition for model consistency, and then the high dimensional inference. So I will uh, assume that W is sparse, and I will denote capital J, uh, ball J, as a set of non-zero non pattern, what uh, people also call the support. And we, there is this very nice support recovery condition for the lasso, which essentially say that the lasso will get the correct signs, and hence the correct uh, zeros, if and only if you have that condition which is true. So Q here is the covariance matrix. JC is, uh, J complement is a set of, inact of irrelevant variables, the ones you want to, uh, to remove. J uh, are the ones you want to keep. And the sign of WJ is the sign of the generating loading vector uh, WJ. So here, the take home message, at least for me, is that uh, what's important is that term. That term is large when you have uh, strong correlations between relevant and irrelevant variables and small otherwise. So essentially, the lasso uh, finds the good pattern uh, only if you have low correlations. Okay, this is, uh, and we'll come back to that later. So small, small notes. So this has been done by many people. Okay, uh, simultaneously. And then, so first notice that the condition depends on W and J. So this is of no practical value, okay? Uh, if you want to know in advance whether you're going to get the good pattern, you need to know the pattern in advance, okay? So it's rather, uh, rather useless. But this being said, you can optimize, uh, you, you can take the, max, the maximum upper bound uh, over all possible signs of W. Of w. Then you get a condition which only depends on the sparsity pattern, but still useless because you don't need, you don't, you don't need, you don't know it in advance, and you can also maximize out with respect to the pattern. Uh, so for all patterns of a given size, then uh, for all patterns of a given size, then you will get a condition which is uh, of some practical significance. Second, uh, it's valid in low and high dimensional settings, so I won't, go, I won't go too much over that, but uh, uh, look at high dimensions in, in later slides. And also important, it does require a lower bound on the magnitude on the non-zero uh, WJ. Okay? So to be able to get a good support, you need uh, the non-zero values to be not too small. So you need a good, um, a good gap between zero and non-zero values. So all these say that, essentially, the, the lasso usually does not get the good zeros, okay? So to me, this is more a negative result than a positive result. And usually, it's, it does select more variables. And you can see this reference uh, for more details. So now there have been an industry on uh, fixing the lasso. 
Okay? So the lasso does not get the good zeros, then uh, it doesn't. So how, how do you make it select the good zeros? So you have a lot of work uh, for doing that. So I think there is one very nice uh, work, which is the adaptive lasso, which is related to concave uh, penalization. So in the adaptive uh, lasso, uh, you, you replace the L1 norm by an L1 norm weighted by, uh, by the inverse of the weights obtained from a previous estimation. So you first start with maybe uh, L2 regularized, regularized estimate or L1 regularized estimate, call that W hat, and then uh, do that to uh, weight the L1 norm. So this will have the effect. So if uh, W hat is uh, zero, so you will uh, uh, never allow WJ being equal to zero uh, for the next estimation. So if you first estimate as zeros, zeros will remain. And if uh, W hat is small, uh, then you will push your W, when you re-estimate, it will push W to be zero if your first W hat was close to zero. Okay, so it will uh, just help the L1 norm to overcome its difficulties. So this is uh, adaptive lasso. And the very interesting part is that it can be framed in terms of concave uh, penalization. So here, what you do when in concave penalization is to uh, minimize the loss term, this won't change, and instead of uh, minimizing a convex a sum of a convex function of uh, the absolute value, you consider a concave uh, function. So this has been uh, done by uh, people in signal processing and uh, machine learning, which are referred to uh, here. So essentially, uh, you replace the L1 norm, which will be like this, by a, a, a square root, for example, uh, here. And uh, intuitively, the square root is closer to the L0 penalty. So what is the L0 penalty? It will be 0 when you're 0, and 1 as soon as you get away from 0. So it will be something looking like, uh, like this. So uh, the lasso is like that, and the square root is like that. So you can see that this is closer to the L0 penalty in a sense. And the good thing is that first, um, you can design, so of course, J is concave now, so it's not convex anymore, so you cannot get the global, the global solution. But you have very simple concave convex procedures, or people call that uh, minimization, majorization, or every community has its way of dealing with concave function. And the way is to uh, bound the concave function by its uh, linear upper bound. Okay? And the good thing is that if you take uh, the linear upper bound, and you st if you start at W hat being, w being uh, only once, you exactly get back the L1 norm. Okay? So essentially, if you do this concave convex procedure with, um, with a square root, for example, and you start with W being equal to 1, you first do the lasso once, and then uh, you have to use the linear upper bound on the square root, which essentially is equivalent to consider alpha equals 1 half here. Okay, so you can see that the adaptive lasso is simply a two-stage optimization of a concave uh, with a concave penalty. Okay, I think to me this is a very uh, nice trick to make more zeros in your problem. So you start with a lasso, you don't get enough zeros, you just rerun uh, the lasso once or twice, and you will create zeros where the lasso was uh, missing them. So I think it's a really uh, really nice uh, nice topic. So there is also uh, work based on resampling by myself, but by lack of time, I will uh, go, go by it. Okay? So first, getting the correct support is uh, nice and good, but do you actually, uh, actually care? Okay? So the one big problem with all those uh, methods and all those theorems is that they need uh, the non-zero variables to be none too small. So you need wj to be bigger than the noise times square root of log p uh, over n. So you need a lower bound on the non-zero values, okay? And more importantly, it's not because you get the wrong variables that you can't predict very well, okay? Bad estimation of the support does not imply uh, bad predictions. So what I will go over right now is to look at results which uh, don't really care whether you get the correct zeros, but they only care about uh, prediction. So this will involve, involve oracle inequalities, so what is an oracle inequality, at least the way I understand uh, it, is that uh, you assume uh, you know the support in advance. Let's say you, you assume that the data was generated from uh, a loading vector ball W with uh, support uh, ball J. If you know ball J, you can just do uh, ordinary least, square, least squares restricted to, uh, uh, to ball J, and you call that W oracle. 
And you know that the, uh, the error made by this oracle depends on the number of variables in, uh, in J. So here, is, here it should be a bold J, okay? So the um, prediction error, the average prediction error made by the, uh, by the oracle is simply uh, goes as uh, the number of non-zero variables times n, uh, divided by n. So this shows that, of course, uh, for this to work, you need this number to be smaller than n. You need that to go to zero, okay? So essentially, what you try to achieve with this uh, sparsity, uh, the sparse methods, is to achieve the rate of uh, convergence of this oracle. You cannot beat, it's hard to beat that one, and you cannot beat it, and the goal is to go uh, close to that uh, optimal prediction rate. So before we go uh, into the theorem for the lasso, I think a very important point is that uh, let's look at the situation when you have infinite uh, computational resources. Let's say you don't care about convexity and you can optimize any possible function. So essentially, uh, what people would do in statistics is consider uh, 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 approaches based on penalization, like close to a BIC, where you want to minimize with respect to the, uh, to the, to the support set. So Z, J is a, is, a super, is a subset of one, uh, one P. This is, what, this is the best possible error you can make if you only use the variables in J, okay? So you take, this is just the uh, ordinary least square when you restrict uh, to variables in J. So this is the training error, and like in BIC, you consider the training error plus some penalization term that will depend on the number of parameters, which is just uh, capital, uh, the cardinal of J, plus, uh, let's, let's remove that guy, it's just a times log P. So it's essentially uh, very close to, uh, to BIC. And the good thing in that setting is that you can, if you could optimize with respect to capital J, so be very clear, this requires to look at all possible subsets of variables, so it requires looking at two to the P uh, subsets. You get this very nice oracle inequality which says that the error that you make at the end is less than a, a constant times the best possible rate, which is just K over N, where K is the number of, uh, of variables which generated your problem, times uh, log P over K, and if K is small, this is just uh, log P. So here you see that, uh, and even better, because this is for Gaussian noise, to make it simple, but there is no assumptions regarding correlations. You don't, need, uh, you don't need your design matrix to be nice. You don't need your covariance to be a close identity. It always, it always works. In a sense, this is what we want to achieve, okay? What we would like to achieve is those, ty this, those types of results with a convex, uh, convex, uh, convex problems. So it's not clear whether it is uh, doable or not, but always keep in mind that this is what you want to achieve, and we are very far with path methods to achieving it, okay? As you will see in the next few slides, we will always add a condition on correlations. We will say that we need only a small correlation between variables, okay? Please keep in mind that if you have time, meaning if you are willing to optimize over a set of size two to the P, there is no need uh, for all that. And what we have, is weaker than uh, those types of results. At the other side of the spectrum, uh, what's happening when you have orthogonal design? So let's take the, simple, uh, the simplest possible setting where uh, your design matrix X uh, has orthogonal uh, columns. So it means that the uh, covariance matrix is identity. And there, uh, your problem will decouple because your your quadratic function, which will define your loss, will be a sum of uh, quadratic functions on individual variables. And now you get exactly uh, soft thresholding. Why? Because when you optimize a quadratic function of a single variable like that, which is what you would obtain, and then the solution uh, must be of that form. You take uh, the value t, so if a is zero, the solution is t. Okay, and if A uh, is not zero, then you will just soft threshold uh, your value T. So if T is positive, you, you remove A. Or if T is larger than A, you remove A. If T, T is smaller than minus A, you add A. And if T is smaller than A in absolute value, you put it to zero. So this is what people call soft thresholding. If you're less than A, you're zero. If not, you're shrunk uh, towards uh, zero. So this is essentially uh, how people have been analyzing those methods, uh, uh, have first been analyzing those methods. And uh, this is where you can prove easily uh, that the lasso will work. 
So let's look very quickly how it works. And uh, here is just to give you an idea, uh, where to, an idea of where does this log p come from, okay? So I don't want to uh, give you a class on uh, concentration inequalities. It's going to be a bit too long. But why, where does this log p come from? And if you look uh, closely at the proofs, and I will only focus on that one, essentially, uh, the way I understand it, I may, I may be wrong, is that the log p comes from the fact that if you take p independent uh, Gaussian variables, okay, or maybe even not independent, the maximum as expectation uh, which grow as square root of log p. Okay? So this is the main reason uh, why. It can be because of the unit bound, but uh, this will be uh, too, long to, uh, too long to explain. But this is, uh, the log p is not, uh, is mag it's not magical. It comes from the uh, expectation of the maximum of normally distributed variables. Okay. So if you look at the paper, so often it's hidden somewhere in the proof, but this is the main reason why. Okay, so now let's get down to the, uh, to the results uh, with, uh, with the lasso before uh, uh, having a pause. First, the main result is that you only need uh, k log p. Uh, you need only uh, uh, k log p can be, needs to be smaller than n for to get good, uh, good uh, predictive performance, okay? So this is the sort of uh, scaling which I had promised at the, on the beginning of the, of the tutorial. But for that, you, need, you, have two, uh, you have two constraints, which are very important. First, W, the generating vector should be sufficient, sufficiently sparse, so K should be small. This is already included, included in, the, uh, in, uh, in here. But input variables should also be not too uh, correlated, okay? And this is very important. If variables are correlated, there is no, there is no way uh, we can prove consistency uh, for the lasso. So now there's a whole industry of sufficient conditions for the lasso. So they start from very simple to very complex. And uh, we'll start for the, from the very simple, which is just mutual incoherence. So here, essentially, uh, so the next two slides will be somewhat with a theorem, so which, uh, which will look a bit uh, complicated, but uh, it's not, in fact. So you assume that your data are generated from, uh, as a sparse linear model plus some noise, where the noise is ID normal. You assume that the uh, covariance matrix, uh, so as unit diagonal and cross terms which are less than one over, uh, one over K times a constant. And then what you could show is that if you select that lambda, you get with high probability, because this will be, uh, this will be small, you get that the error, error that you make is less Time is less than sigma times the square root of log p over n. Okay, so this so this result can be derived in a few lines. It's not easy, but this can be derived in a few lines, and Karim Lunisi does that uh, very well. So this is the sort of result you, we might get uh, for the lasso if you assume very low correlations, because take k being two. Okay, with k being two, this requires that the correlation between each of the variable is less than one over twenty-eight. So one over 28 is like, uh, like very, very small, okay? Uh, I don't know how it is, but it's very small. Um, so it shows that you need a very uh, small correlations. And of course, uh, every time you want to apply those types of methods, if you were to plot the, uh, the covariance matrix, do an histogram, you will be a lot of values close to one, okay? So by any mean, it will be less than one over, one over k. So now people have been saying, okay, this is a too simple an, an assumption, so let's take a better assumption. And this is what you get. You get what I call it's better, and in terms it implies it is a strictly better than the previous one, but it starts to get complicated, okay? So I won't get into the details uh, of, that, uh, of that condition. It's linked with the sparse eigenvalues, but uh, just the goal is to give you a flavor of the types of results which are available in this, uh, in this field. Always the same scaling, uh, lambda square root of n times log p. So for those who know the problem, I have not divided the loss by n, okay? That's why it's, it is square root of n times log p and not square root of log p over n, uh, just to make things clear. And what you get is, what, which I wanted to get to, is that if you assume all that, then you get the error that you make is less than a constant time, uh, times your oracle uh, performance times log p, which was the goal uh, of all that. So people can achieve 
this, uh, though the, the people like BK, Tibakov, and Al can achieve Oracle inequalities with, uh, lost, with a loss of only, only log P. So of course, here you have a lot uh, of problems uh, on top of that. Uh, the first one being that uh, the scaling, this depends on K. So the way your bound depend on K, depends on K is somewhat mysterious. And also, of course, uh, most, most, most uh, important is that most of these conditions you cannot compute in polynomial time, okay? So what those results are saying is that if this is true, the lasso would work. But you can never check that this is true, okay? So in a sense, this is also of no practical value, in the sense that uh, you cannot check in advance uh, that uh, your conditions are true. So if you take, for example, uh, that one, this is, uh, I'm not sure it's NP-hard, but I'm sure it's close. Uh, 